UFOs and ETs in the Bible? Interesting question. Uh, it, we got to define our terms right. a little bit, I think. Right. So, uh, in as far as there were sons of God coming down, there were demons coming down, then yes, there are aliens because the demons of yesterday are today's aliens. That's really the bottom line. Uh, there are not aliens from some distant galaxy or from the Pleiades system or anything like that. They are very much from here. They're demonic. And so, in as far as there were demons, then, then yes. But, you know, we, we can't call them demons or gods from yesteryear because that's really out of fashion. Right. But you can call them aliens because now they're from some other place and they evolved. It's interesting how evolution has served as such a foundation for this. Mm -hmm. You know, God, I mean, the, the demons, Satan gets us thinking that there is no God, that there is so no Satan or any demons. But then he starts replacing it with these other entities. And we believe in evolution, you know, lots of people do. And so that serves as the foundation for these other worldly beings that have also evolved, not by God, mind you. But they're, they're you know, they've evolved from a long time ago. And as far as UFOs, well, UFO is an unidentified flying object. Um, and we're seeing those today. People are seeing those all over the place. And generally what they look like is just some kind of a, a white light. It's a white ball of light or something like this that's floating around in the sky. And people don't say, oh, it's a kite. Now we can all see what a kite looks like. They're not helicopters. We know what helicopters look like. We're not stupid, right? Neither are the people that take all these videos. And, and you can watch them on YouTube. I mean, yeah. there's just thousands of them. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a few pranksters out there. Right. But sure, but, but still, just the, the quantity and even the quality of the video is such that you're like, wow, that's really amazing. Um, so in the Old Testament, you find places where the heavens were opened. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elijah and his servant are surrounded by the Syrians. They wake up one morning and the servant goes outside and he sees all these guys. He's like, oh boy. He goes back in and says, Master, we're done. And Elijah, you know, he's just very calm and he prays, oh Lord, I pray you'd open his eyes. And so God opens the young man's eyes and he looks all around him and he sees these horses and chariots of fire. Now that's interesting. Why would God need to use chariots of fire? Well, I don't know the answer. I mean, you think you could just go, you know, kind of Star Trek kind of thing. You know, you just you go from here to there. But for some reason, in that other dimension, you have horses of fire. You got these chariots of fire, and these things are are going around. And in some way, I would suspect that the demons are kind of doing the same thing. I don't know if they're on horses of fire necessarily, but they're when they materialize. They look like these, these fiery white orbs. And, you know, however they're transporting themselves, I don't know. But it's not like they can just think it and they're there, but they have to somewhat travel, they have to traverse through whatever medium, the spiritual medium or through the, the physical medium, they're actually moving about. So, again, I, I wouldn't say that we have, you know, what we call technical UFOs back then, but you did have these horses and chariots of fire in that angelic spiritual realm. There's movement going on. Uh, angels have wings. Again, why would they have wings? Right? Is there air in that? It's, these are questions we just don't know. Right. You know we, we just don't know the answer to these things. But still, there's a function for these things. If they have wings, then they must need them. If there are horses and chariots of fire, then they must need those in some capacity that I don't understand. And we're not really told, but still, there it is. So, um, what we're seeing today is a resurgence. It, we're, we're really, we're just, we're, I don't know so much a resurgence, we're seeing a breakthrough of that realm into our own. And, and, and those demons are coming through, somehow they're being able to manifest in this realm. I don't know how they do that, but they're doing it. They're manifesting, and they're up in the skies. I mean, millions of people have seen these things. Right. Uh, you even have sort of uh, more famous people like Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. He claimed to have seen something a number of times. Jimmy Carter, uh, Barry Goldwater, uh, Douglas MacArthur, 
All right, just to name a few of the presidents, you have other world leaders. You have uh, Michu Kaku, who's a real famous uh, physicist. Let me make a prediction, and that is sometime by mid-century, we might make contact with an intelligent civilization in outer space. Plus you have you know, just lots and lots of astronauts. They say that every time that we had a, a mission, we were being followed by something. We were being watched. We saw some craft. We saw something. Right? And you can, you can watch some of these videos that have been released by NASA, and you can see these things out there. Right? So there's definitely something out there. The question is, what is it? Scholars with no religious affiliation who have looked into this topic of UFOs and ETs for several decades have come to very interesting conclusions. Jack Vallée, a venture capitalist, computer scientist, author, ufologist, and former astronomer who helped build the precursor to what we know as the internet, has studied the UFO phenomenon for over three decades. After looking into the relationship between UFOs, cults, religious movements, demons, angels, ghosts, and psychic phenomenon, Vallée changed his proposed hypothesis from the UFO phenomenon being an extraterrestrial origin, in other words, craft and beings from another planet or a faraway galaxy, to a multi-dimensional visitation hypothesis, or interdimensional. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Vallée states, quote, Human beings are under the control of a strange force that bends them in absurd ways, forcing them to play a role in a bizarre game of deception." End quote. Later in the same book, he states, quote, "...the UFO phenomenon represents a manifestation of a reality that transcends our current understanding of physics. The UFOs are physical manifestations that cannot be understood apart from their psychic and symbolic reality." What we see in effect here is not an alien invasion. It is a control system which acts on humans and uses humans." End quote. J. Allen Hynek, a U.S. astronomer, professor, and ufologist best remembered for his contributions in the field of UFOs and acting as scientific advisor to UFO studies taken by the U.S. Air Force, again came to same conclusions of the UFOs and alleged extraterrestrial phenomenon. In his book, Edge of Reality, he states, quote, If UFOs are somebody else's nuts and bolts hardware, then we must still explain how such tangible hardware can change shape before our eyes, vanish in a Cheshire cat manner, not even leaving a grin, seemingly melt away in front of us, or apparently materialize mysteriously before us without apparent detection by persons nearby or in neighboring towns. We must wonder, too, where UFOs are hiding when not manifesting themselves to human eyes. End quote. The overall consensus seems to be that these crafts which are being seen have the ability to manifest as physical objects and at the same time manipulate time and space as to become invisible or perform aerial maneuvers that defy our current understanding of physics and nature. The deeper side to this phenomenon are the abduction accounts recorded by millions of people all over the world, regardless of time, race, culture, and upbringing. Dr. John Mack, professor at Harvard Medical School, a psychiatrist and writer, also looked into the UFO and abduction phenomenon for several decades and came to similar conclusions as Vallée and Hynek. Although he recently passed away, his contributions to the study of ufology and alien abductions is highly touted and greatly respected. He states in an interview with Nova Online when asked if the phenomenon is literally physical or psychological, stating, quote, Yes, it's both. It's both literally physically happening to a degree, and it's also some kind of psychological, spiritual experience occurring and originating perhaps in another dimension. And so the phenomenon stretches us, or it asks us to stretch to open to realities that are not simply the literal physical world, but to extend to a possibility that there is other unseen realities from which our consciousness, our, if you will, learning processes, over the past several hundred years have closed us off." End quote. So it seems to be the case is they come from some other domain, some place, maybe not another star or maybe from another dimension, but they manifest, they show up here 
in our physical world. People what have a this? number of cases where people are just plain gone. A child comes into the mother's room. Mom, you weren't there during the night when I came. There is burned earth outside where the ships have landed. There is physical. It may not satisfy our criteria of proof, but proof may be something which only operates within the frame of evidence of this physical world in the box you mentioned before right. that we live in. This is what's going on here is something in some ways more subtle. In other words, something coming from another dimension into our world, which is very commonly experienced in other cultures, but not in this culture. Uh, John Mack, who recently passed away, but he was at Harvard. And you know, according to his own testimony, he says, and I was not a believer in this thing. He didn't, he wasn't trying to prove anything. He just kept hearing about these things. So, and so he came to this conclusion that they were, these were real physical abductions. Very, very slowly he came to that conclusion. And rather skeptically, he didn't want to come to that conclusion. But eventually the data was so much that he could not overcome it. And he had to just say, well, it's happened. Something physical is happening. Dr. David Jacobs uh, did, has done similar research. He was quite upbeat about this whole thing for a long time. But in the last several years, He's become very downcast about his discoveries because he's discovering that these beings that are taking people are smarter than us, they're stronger than us, and they're, they have a, a hybridization program going on, right. that they're creating a hybrid race to take over, and he says at best we're going to be second class serfs. So he's very discouraged, and I can see why. You know, I think if, if, you come, if you discover these things, and yet you don't understand that there's a greater power, which is Jesus Christ, who has a much better plan, then I would be extremely depressed. You know, I mean, and in a way, I'm sort of upbeat about the whole thing, because I see that we are getting very close to right. the end. Right. But it's also kind of scary. I mean, yeah. there's just crazy things going on. Dr. David Jacob, an associate professor of history at Temple University, specializing in 20th century American history and culture, has also studied the UFO and abduction phenomenon for over 40 years. In an interview with L.A. Marzulli in the book Alien Interviews, Jacobs comments on the alien abduction phenomenon, stating, quote, This is a phenomenon that is either psychological or it is happening. There is very little in the middle. I have learned that the abduction phenomenon is vast, global, and it occurs with great frequency." End quote. Whitley Strieber, in his classic account of an alien encounter in the book Communion, records his experience with these entities, stating, quote, I became entirely given over to extreme dread. The fear was so powerful that it seemed to make my personality become evaporate. Whitley ceased to exist. What was left was a body in a state of raw fear so great that it swept about me like a thick, suffocating curtain, turning paralysis into a condition that seemed close to death. I died and a wild animal appeared in my place." End quote. Then in a later release in a book entitled Transformation, The Breakthrough, he dives deeper into the experience, stating, quote, "...increasingly I felt as if I were entering a struggle that might even be more than life and death. It might be a struggle for my soul, my essence, or whatever part of me might have reference to the eternal. There are worse things than death, I suspected. So far, the word demon has never been spoken among the scientists and doctors who are working with me. Alone at night, I worried about the legendary cunning of demons. At the very least, I was going stark, raving mad." End quote. Then later in the same book, he states, quote, I felt an absolutely indescribable sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there in the presence of these entities. And yet I couldn't move, couldn't cry out, couldn't get away. I lay as still as death, suffering inner agonies. Whatever was there seemed so monstrously ugly, so filthy and dark and sinister. Of course they were demons, they had to be, and they were here and I couldn't get away." End quote. According to many researchers in the field, and even the people who have directly experienced this phenomenon for themselves, all seem to agree that there is a spiritual element driving this phenomenon. It is clear that there is a metaphysical nature to the UFOs and the alien abductions themselves. Furthermore, the startling similarities with the phenomenon with the occult and other historical mythological accounts of direct contact with demonic entities should be alarming. 
Jack Vallée alludes to this concept, stating, quote, The symbolic display seen by the abductees is identical to the type of initiation ritual or astral voyage that is embedded in the occult traditions of every culture. The structure of abduction stories is identical to that of occult initiation rituals. The UFO beings of today belong to the same class of manifestation as the occult entities that were described in centuries past." End quote. There is another angle to this phenomenon that is seldom discussed but is very important to point out. That is the solution to help stop those who experience the alien abduction phenomenon. Joe Jordan, state-sanctioned director and field investigator for MUFON, through his investigation at CE4 Research Group, has discovered that calling upon the name of Jesus Christ during the abduction can make the experience stop instantly. On their website, ce4research.com, the mission statement states, quote, The mission of CE4 Research Group is to share with the world the most powerful evidence known that exposes the alien entities for who they really are. The evidence is in the testimony of those who have overcome the experience, the oppression, the bondage, the harassment, the control, the lies, the deception that these entities perpetuate by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Through this evidence of these testimonies, we will be able to help others. The world asks for this evidence and we will give it to them." End quote. A lot of the people that have seen my videos know my testimony of how it all started with one book on a vacation trip to visit my brother I picked up one book ufo crash at roswell and uh, it was like opening a doorway into something that would totally change my life and uh, it has and it's changed a number of times since then but that one started it. it it put me on a quest to find out what this ufo phenomenon was about and like i said i came into it as a, an agnostic with an open mind and what I thought was total objectivity and became a MUFON investigator, was doing UFO investigation, sighting investigations for a few years, and then got caught up in uh, what is called the New Age belief system and metaphysical studies because, you know, it's part of this UFO phenomenon. It goes hand in hand. I was caught up in all of that, too, and it changed my worldview again uh, from being, you know, an agnostic humanist to one who was into the new age and actually practicing these metaphysical studies myself and uh, I was able to see the UFO phenomenon through another set of eyes and then in 1996 um, I was shown the true gospel uh, where I actually caught my attention and uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in November of 1996 and now I was able to look at this phenomenon in yet another set of eyes. So initially, was this what I was looking for? No, it was not. Well, the first case I came across, I actually had interviewed this gentleman who claimed to have had an abduction experience, along with other sighting experiences and um, other what he felt were abduction experiences too. But he we decided to interview him, and this was six months before I became a Christian. Um, this was in the middle of 1996 that we did the interview with him. And I used to come to my monthly meetings, my MUFON meetings that I had, and he just wanted to share what he had been through, you know, and he was had a, an interest because of his experiences in the UFO phenomenon. And uh, myself and one of my lead investigators, uh, actually my partner that helped me found CE4 very, in the very beginning, uh, his name was Wes Clark. He was a very good investigator, worked for the Space Center at the time as a quality inspector. And uh, he had a good organizational skill of helping do these investigations. And him and I interviewed this gentleman in his home for two hours on videotape and just let him talk and we asked some questions and would guide him along just to try to get all of his information. Well, we put it away and we didn't see anything unusual at the time. And that was interesting in itself that we didn't catch this. But when I became a believer in, my, in November of 96, I was ready to put all of this away because God showed me what this UFO experience was about, that it, there was a evil demonic side to it. And uh, I felt that as a new Christian and wanting to do uh, the things that God asked of me, that we shouldn't be involved in this, and I'd put it away. And 
God says, no, I got plans for you, and you need to take the, this message back to, you know, the, where you came from. And I said, you know, I can't take the Word of God back to these New Age people. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, they don't believe it to be the inerrant Word of God. As a matter of fact, they don't even be, believe in God being a personal, you know, being, an entity that they can relate to. So I said, you got to give me something better. And nobody told me that as a new Christian, you don't talk to God like that. But uh, I did, not knowing any better. <laughs> and he answered, and he says, uh, guess what? You already have it. You just haven't seen it. And I couldn't understand what that meant at first. So I asked my partner, Wes, who was a Christian at the time. But, and uh, I said, we've got something here somewhere uh, that we need to go back and look at. We went back and looked at some of the cases that we had, and we pulled this particular one back out. It was a gentleman named Bill D. We pulled his video back out, plugged it into the VCR, and sat back and started watching and went, oh my, do you remember hearing this? And Wes mm -hmm. says, I don't. And we were sitting right there watching the gentleman and listening to him, but yet we were blinded and deafened at the time we did the recording. Mm -hmm. Nothing registered until this time when God said, go back and look, you already have it. And what he shared was an experience, atypical, abduction type experience, um, where he had been taken, the experience being taken, and immediately panicked and in fear, and he himself actually just being a brand new Christian called out during this panic experience in saying Jesus Jesus help me and when he did that in an instant the experience abruptly stopped and he felt like he was thrown back into his bed he even startled his wife she asked him why he was jumping on the bed and uh, he said you know when he shared that experience he didn't understand what it meant and when we heard that we knew we had something because never before in all the studies we had done of the other work that the top researchers had done in the country, you know, this was 15 years ago, um, the big names, never before had anybody said that an experience could be stopped. As a matter of fact, they, they all said that it wasn't possible to stop an experience. Mm -hmm. Okay? But yet we had a gentleman that said he did, and in a particular way. So I contacted the, these top researchers around the country, got their home phones, called them up. They're nice guys. They can talk. You can talk to them just like me and you were talking. Most of them are very nice gentlemen. And I've met them at the conferences over the years. And uh, I said, guys, I've got a very unusual case here. I'd like to run it by you and see what you think. And uh, after I share the story, they all asked, can we go off the record? And I said, well, that's fine. I said, uh, I'm just trying to get answers here. Well, when I say go off the record, that means I can't tell you who said what, but I can tell you what they said. Well, these guys, uh, they said that, yes, we had come across similar cases where people had cried out in the name of Jesus or had quoted scripture or had sung a Christian hymn, and the experience stopped. And I said, really? And I said, first off, I've never read anywhere where you guys have said that an experience can even be stopped. And then second, I've never read where you've stated where they could be stopped in any type of manner like this. And I said, why is that? And one of two answers or both answers would come out from each of these researchers. The first one was pretty common amongst them, was we didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> and, but you know what? I would have been fine with that because, to me, that was an honest answer. I mean, I didn't know what to make of it either in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I, I could relate to them on that answer, but they always would follow it with a second answer. And it was, we were afraid to go there, meaning the spiritual side of this, mm -hmm. because it might affect our credibility in the UFO realm. So huh. what I was seeing is they had research evidence, part of the UFO puzzle that we've all been trying to put together. 
but they chose not to share it because of it might of it affecting their credibility not that it was getting to the truth or it was completing an entire puzzle but because of personal issues personal mm. agendas and you know what that's called it's called a cover up throughout the UFO community you hear government cover up this government cover up that but i'm telling you from experience in dealing with this type of case that there's been a cover up all along by the researchers in this UFO community phenomenon that are supposedly giving us the truth and the answers to this experience it's coming from them because they've got personal agendas they only want to share certain things you know and if you ever follow these conferences that are going on out there it's like they never give you the whole thing you know you get little bits and pieces and i guess it's part of keeping you busy coming to their conferences you know but i've been sharing the same message for years now the same evidence and it still disturbs them there are several testimonies on ce4research.com and i encourage anyone who has either been affected by the phenomenon or know someone who has to take a look at this research it is much too important not to in an article on hearkenthewatchman.com entitled demons or extraterrestrials tremble at the name of jesus christ dr stephen ulish comes to the same conclusion stating quote I believe in UFOs and extraterrestrials. I do not believe that either I am delusional or am I hallucinating. I do believe that the government is covering up these phenomena even though they are being bewitched as to its real meaning. This deception is part of the spiritual war between God and Satan. These are therefore serious topics." End quote. 